Thank you. We're good. All right. So I, there's a lot going on in this place, and they're having to. They're learning to adjust uh, with the fact that we actually we're starting to look like a church. Um, it's weird, um, uh, but we 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 know we're we're not a church. Um, I don't know what church qualifications are to be a church, but um, judgment. Judgment. <laughs> um, but in a sense of us being a part of something bigger than ourselves, greater than ourselves, connected to something that is infinitely larger than ourselves, and yet connected to something that is significantly aware of every detail, which was the, uh, the uh, definition of God that a young man gave me who was um, riding the fence of agnosticism and atheist, and, and atheist. And at the end of our times together, he said his definition of God was infinitely larger than, um, than myself or anything and significantly aware of every detail. And I love that definition. There's many, many names of God um, as we look at God's nature, even through Scripture. Um, everlasting Father, faithful and true, and there's... Hebrew that I wouldn't even try to I thought about pronouncing them because it just makes it feel you know more impressive like Jehovah Jireh you know Elohim uh, Shabbat you know so I'm giving you the English versions all right um, the foundation friend to tax collectors and sinners is actually a Hebrew word for that gentle whisper how, how cool is that gentle whisper uh, gift of God, glory of the Lord, God Almighty, the one who sees me, shepherd, great high priest, guide, heir of all things, holy one, uh, the, 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 the highest image, um, king of all ages, leader, light of the world, like an eagle, Living stone, living water, Lord of all. And there's many, many more. Um, so that's why I like to refer to it as the mystery that we call God. Mystery doesn't mean that we can't know it. Mystery means that it's eternally knowable. And we step into the eternal knowing of God. That we can be dazzled by how intimately close we can feel and experience God, and yet we can start our prayers by saying, God, I don't even know you. Because it's eternally knowable, and we enter into that time. So think in terms of what God is to you right now, in the moment that you're in. If you were to name God, what would God's name be right now in your life? Is it calmer in the midst of chaos? Is it healer in the midst of physical pain? Is it companion in the midst of loneliness? And then raise that name of God to that highest level that we just participated in human ways in little tiny uh, areas. So let's just take a meditative time to just think that about that. What is God to you? What, what is the name of God for you that he's offering right now? God, we confess that we have named you other things. <coughs> that the false gods of our life have drawn our attention. We are choosing to enter in 
enter into the mystery that You are because we've lived too long in the tangible knowing of what You aren't. We've named You busy. We've named you alcohol. We've named you shame. We've named you fear. And now we name you peace. The God who knows, the God who sees, the God who calls, the God who loves. We calm our bodies. We breathe the breath of your presence. We let go just for these next few minutes of our racing thoughts and our anxiety and our curiosity and our questions and our need for guaranteed outcomes. We let those go with an understanding that God, if it's okay, we'd like to take them back after this is over for a while, and then practice letting them go again. Teach us what love is. In the name of the one that we call Father, because you are for us. Jesus, because you walk alongside of us. And Holy Spirit, because you are in us. Amen. <clears throat> so we've been doing this series and I am I am I'm com I am completely amazed that I actually did a series and that it has an ending a completion I don't I don't finish anything I I I may not finish it today I'm thinking I'm going to finish it but I don't know we might go down a side road you know I <laughs> And it might turn into 10 more parts, I don't know. But we have looked at, just as a quick little run, 2 Peter chapter 1, it's on the back of, of your um, churchy looking bulletin agenda thingy. Um, and we have gotten from faith, and quiz time, somebody give me the definition of faith. Action. 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 The face of faith. Oh, yeah, it's on the back. Hi. Chris, he said it all like, I, I'm I got it from Brad. <laughs> Action taken in the face of great fear and doubt. That means it's not a lack of doubt, it's a lack of fear. It's, it's that I'm taking a step in the midst of it. And goodness. Oh, that's going to bother me now. You know it's going to bother me. Is my my faith was 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 faint. There. Add to my faith goodness, goodness the right direction. I may not know where I'm going, but I'm going. It's Thomas Merton's prayer that has included in that. Um, God, I don't actually know if I'm pleasing you or not, but my guess is the actual idea that I want to must mean that it pleases you. That it pleases you. The desire of the heart, the direction that I'm going. Adding to our goodness knowledge. Concepts mean nothing unless there's experience and failure. Experience and failure lead to concepts, not the other way around. Otherwise we're just spewing nice quotes and putting them on Instagram. I'm, a, I'm guilty of it. Okay, I read somebody else's quote and I'm like, 
Wow, everyone needs to hear me quote that because I'm going to be cool when they see it and go, like, heart, thumb up, by uh, dancing. I know I put the wrong icon a lot, um, emoji, you know. Uh, you got to be careful with that, by the way. Just because it's that doesn't mean exactly what it is and you can get yourself in trouble. I think. But that... But that quote came from somebody who experienced something originally. So experience your thing and come up with your own quote. But also identify with the quotes you see to validate your experience. If it's validating your experience, awesome. If it's because you're deflecting something you thought was cool so that people think you're cool on Facebook, now you're shallow, okay? Not shallow in a, I'm attacking you, you're shallow, you're not very smart. But the thinking isn't going from head to heart, it's going from head to mouth. It's making a quick 90 degree angle right out the mouth. I think that's what scripture says when it says, do not cast your pearls to the swine. You know, that sounds so harsh. Who are the swine, Jesus? Man, that's, that's cold, man. You know? Pearls don't look good on pigs? I don't really know what that, you know. What that's saying is when you get a truth, you get it, you and God, in the below the surface darkness of the soul, on that dark night of the soul, you heard something, learned something, grabbed something, and it's between you and God. I don't know about you, but I immediately want to share things I learn. I get excited. I want to share it, okay? you got to fill up the jacuzzi of your life with that truth and sit in it for a while. Sit it until you spiritually get pruny. Okay? It's yours. It was for you. It wasn't for your mom or your sister or your brother. Okay? It wasn't like, man, I wish I would have, my friend Buford would have heard this message today. They would have liked this. This was for them. That's it going like this. We sit in it. We resonate it. Resonate in it. You know, we, uh, I don't think that's a word. Uh, it resonates in us. We take that in and we learn and we grow through it until it becomes a part of us because what ends up happening is our roots start to take, uh, they start to go deep. And, and it seems like work, doesn't it? I like to move on to the next thing. I hate, to, I'm not kidding you. I hate it. I like to just share it quickly. That was cool. Let's move on to the next thing. Learn another thing. Learn another thing. Learn another thing. The contemplative life is taking it in and then letting it sit with you let it simmer, soak in it, until it starts to take on a whole other form. Okay? You've got to... I, I got an image, so now i got to share it, because it may be irrelevant. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> feels like canned laughter. feels like we're doing a sitcom now, right? The people on the camera don't know what I'm saying, but that whole other room applauding is awesome. I'm feeling like I'm on a roll. Yeah! <laughs> Not only are we not a church, we're a, not a Pentecostal church. All of a sudden, we're like really going. So, um, so in that, uh, it's hard for me to stop and let it simmer and not tell somebody who I, I I share things with. You know what I just learned? It's so awesome. I was reading. I, I'll do that with my poor sister sometimes. So I'll come out of you know my my room because I'm working on something. I'm in at my desk and I, I get a, an epiphany when I'm reading something or whatever. And I'm like, you know what? I gotta share this with you. My brother knows that too. I don't I don't let it simmer too long in me without sharing it. I have to tell myself this is for me and no one else. This is between me and God. Those are pearls to me. To somebody else. It might not be pearls. And you can usually tell when they go, huh. <laughs> and they're like, no, you don't understand. You don't understand how cool this is and how cool I am for sharing it with you right now. <laughs> but then when you have an experience with somebody else that's a near-death experience, you know, a traffic thing and you survived, or, or, or a vacation, or a vista, or you're on a hiking trip and you see an eagle, or whatever, those kinds of things, you try and you come home and you share them, and you still get, oh, that's cool. Yeah, it's not just cool. Don't you want to see the pictures on my phone? All 147 of them? You know? No, don't go that way. You don't want to see those pictures. No, go the other way. Go the other way. Keep going that way, right? I don't know about 
about you, but after two, I'm just going like this. Cool. You know? But to, to the other person, they're pearls. What we, what we do with God in secret is, is what is valuable to us and how God knows us. Okay, so, so we get that in there. So faith, goodness, goodness, knowledge, knowledge, the 70s funk band, okay? Soul control, I am being led by the spirit of truth, teaching my soul to calm down. Bringing peace into the restlessness of my soul, adding to soul control, perseverance. Okay, and now we're, I'm going to go this way because the board, there's nothing spiritually significant about me changing direction. Okay. Soul control, uh, soul control, perseverance, and then godliness. Is that right? Who we are hanging out with is rubbing off on us. Okay, um, so if I start wearing Ray-Ban Wayfarers and start, I get uh, hair replacements because, because I'm hanging out with Bill all the time, right? And I start to laugh like him and, and I'm, I'm starting to be more and more like Bill. My kids are like, oh my God, Dad, you just laughed like Bill. I'm like, you're hanging out so much with him, I developed a, a, a billiness. Okay, Williamliness, uh, uh, and that's what God. You're, you start to reflect who you're hanging out with, the more you hang out with God, and then you add to your godliness. Uh, what's the next one? Brother, and here we are with brotherly kindness. When I talked about this when we first started, we talked about this big alchemy changing lower metals into gold and we're seeing this 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 journey that's going on and i i mess up a lot okay it's usually in this area i uh, things get the best of me my belief about myself gets the best of me my own reality gets the best of me my self-consciousness and i blow it and i go into this loop and i have to start all over but now I realize that when I insert an act of faith, an act of faith in the face of great fear and doubt right in here, I moved in, I moved into several soul controls in a role and I'm beginning to experience the benefits that come with that life, that life of sobriety, that life of not reacting the life that, that I have always longed for, and then I start to reflect where I came from, and now, look at this, brotherly kindness. See, the problem was that in our Christian faith, we were told to have this first. They'll know we are Christians by our love, was the old song I used to sing when we were little. You know that one? And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. They'll know we are Christians by our love. It's all about how we look in the image. So you can only sing that song. You either sang it with shame or you sang it with paha. You know, we're Christians and you're not. Why? Because we're kind and loving. Jerk. <laughs> this is a fruit of the Spirit. Brotherly kindness is a fruit of the Spirit. And so if it's a fruit of the Spirit in Galatians, then it takes us back to the sense of belonging since I recognize that I am belong and God's name of loving kindness, He has shown His loving kindness to me, I am transforming into being loving kindness to others. Okay? Not a very human thing. That's why it's a spiritual thing. Otherwise, I'm just doing it out of duty. I'm doing it because that's the way I'm supposed to be. God will be happy if I'm that way. I would like to know that it's beginning to be a part of who I am in my nature than to think that it's a part of my theology or it's just a good idea. Okay? And then the last one, finally, is love. So we have this alchemy. God, to me, in the sense of belonging, and me responding with the Godness to others. So that's the alchemy. So. We see 
in scripture in in uh, John or Jesus's uh, conversation with John or with Peter in in John 21. This is after he he rises from the dead. He makes him he appears, and it's such a just a beautiful interactions that he's having with them. He's meets them. He he goes ahead of the lake when they are coming across. And he's, it says in John 21 that he is uh, actually sets up a campfire and he's making breakfast for them. How cool is that? How come we don't think of the Jesus of Scripture that way? That he's actually, you know, they're like, something smells good. Hey, there's, that's Jesus. He's like, come and eat breakfast. How cool is that? And this was after all they had been through and after Peter had denied Jesus three times. See, guys, if we think that we have to start with this before we ever belong to God, that it has to be about behavior, then not only are we screwed, but Peter is too because he denied Jesus three times. Three times. And now they're coming up on shore. And the Jesus, however he has appeared to them, is inviting them to breakfast. And they're beginning to have this intimate time of, of, uh, uh, of a meal together. And as that's happening, and I love that it says that he broke the bread and gave it to them. He's reminding them that even though those were the roughest three days of your life, and mine too, by the way, he said, <laughs> all right, you were just lonely. I'm breaking the bread to remind you I'm with you. I will, I will never leave you or forsake you. And they have this meal together. Now they're beginning to experience all of this. The brokenness, the failure, the denial, the betrayal. They're starting to look back at their humanness. You can't become more spiritual if you don't become more human in your understanding. Recognizing your humanity is what leads us to spirituality. We have to recognize our humanness, our brokenness, our inability, our inefficiency, our inadequacy before we can ever begin to experience that spiritual nature because it blows our ego apart and our pride. It tells us that we were, were helpless and hopeless, so I'm not trying to be more than I thought I was now. I'm accepting who I really am in my humanness and I realize that I said in a couple of other messages that God loved me sublimely. Sublimely. Not because I have become what He wants me to be, but as a good, eternal, supreme Father loves, He cups our cheeks in His hands and says, I love you perfectly in your imperfection. Everything about you that is so imperfect, I love you in all those aspects. And that's what a good parent of belonging does. Look, look, look at what you did and wow, and you're like, I failed when I did it. Yeah, but you did it. It was you, you were created in my image. See, God calls us in this new aspect of things, this off now. the cool thing would be to slip it. What? There we go. We have one. That'll work. Okay. So what we what we have now is we are. Um, we've been this in our spiritual life. We've been an inventor. Okay? So, an inventor, a, an inventor devises some new process. Um, so, an inventor devises some new process. Okay? So, it devises some new process. Um, it makes things. 
kind of something else, a new way. But here's three more words that it does. Have you ever been talking to somebody and their story doesn't seem like the same as yours? And you're hearing it and you're like, that's not how it happened. They fabricate. They concoct. And they hatch. <laughs> hatch a new plan. They concoct something. Inventor. It's a great thing, okay? But in the spiritual life and your identity, this is not good. We have been inventors of our own life, deciding that we're unworthy, inadequate, and hopeless. That, 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 that all of that is what's identifying me. I'm inventing my image of God. Somebody once said that God made us in his image and then we return the favor. I don't remember who said that, Mr. Anonymous. And, uh, and so that's, that's what we're called to do is to create, okay? So cr to create is simply to bring into existence. It's to bring into existence what already is. So if, if somebody is already loved of God, I participate in His divine nature by acknowledging the fact that they're loved by God. Do you see the problem with judgment now? If, if the last aspect of 2 Peter 1 that leads to brotherly kindness and love were the default of all of our interactions and cultural decisions, it would change everything. But we don't. We make morality the top issue. We make behavior the top issue. If, if, if love is going to be that aspect of it, then we're going we're gonna to recognize that somebody is loved by God and I have a decision on whether I'm going to participate in His loveliness or am I going to participate in fear. Notice I didn't say hate. Because the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is fear. The opposite of love is fear. So we began to create. Let me, let me give you a little example of it. And I, I think I've mentioned this example before. You're driving down the street and you come to a corner and there's that guy with a sign and he's been living on the street and you come to the light and you're the one right there. And he's right there. And he's like this. <laughs> and you don't have any cash. It's not that you don't want to give him cash. You, and, and I don't know if you're like me, I actually look around if, as if there's a thing I can give him that's in my car. <laughs> hey, here, take the seat belt. I don't know what, you know. And so you don't have any cash. If you're a normal human being, you want to just look down, look away. You might even been the one that's on the corner and know what it's like to have somebody sitting in the car and them not seeing the discomfort. And we feel shame, we feel unease, and we feel like we'd like the light to change really quick. We're uncomfortable. It's not that we're not caring. And you sit. But what if we made eye contact? What if we made eye contact? Not eye contact that said, I don't actually have any cash right now, which looks like this. <laughs> okay? Not that one. But a, a, a look of acknowledgement. They'll do it back. And you make that eye contact. When we make that eye contact, we're doing what is called micro-affirmations. The micro-affirmations are the subtle ones that nobody <coughs> thinks are, is, are big enough. But they're acknowledging because what you've done with that person is that you have created and brought into, you have brought into existence the life and the love that is when you acknowledge that. Is, aren't those the things that get cut off when we're angry at each other? Right? We can't yell at somebody and go like this. <laughs> It's just hard. 
So just in an other way, we bring into existence and acknowledge that person. You know, we make that connection. We make that connection of who they are. The times when we do that the most, funerals, funerals and uh, births. You're not doing anything. You're just present. Okay, you, if you're having the baby, you're obviously doing something. Or it's doing something to you and you're mad. I, you know, but, but either way, you are, you are nearby to experience this with them. Your mere presence is of great worth. And your presence and your acknowledgement, your micro-affirmations are bringing life. There is another thing that is the opposite of that, and it's called micro-inequity. It is about individuals when individuals are either singled out, overlooked, ignored, or otherwise discounted based on an unchangeable characteristic. Mm. Microaggressions. Micro, uh, microaggression that you don't know when you're being discriminated against. You have no idea. It's so subtle. It's, you know, we, we, we're arguing in this culture about the things we see. But these microaggressions have been going on for a long time. We feel them with each other. We feel them in our homes. We feel them. They're microaggressions. That, that, that uh, inequity. These are subtle messages sent either consciously or unconsciously. And they can reveal more about the true nature of a relationship than the surface words alone. Right? So in that regard, um, we have a, that book that, that people read a lot, uh, The Five Languages, the, the Five Love Languages. All right? Wonderful. We're going to do that. Okay, so the five love languages are words of affirmation, quality time, uh, receiving or giving gifts, acts of service, and physical touch. All right? And... Um, and so you find out how that other person's love language is receiving gifts. That when you, you give them a gift, they light up. They want that more than an act of service or a word of affirmation. All right? Give me, give me something done around here. <laughs> Bring me flowers. Um, you know, that kind of a thing. It's understandable. But here's the problem. If you've never had that done for you, and that's not how you process well, now you see the conflict? Because those, those are, are simply uh, uh, deliberate micro-affirmations. But they don't get at the root of the problem that you now feel that you belong. So I can give you words of affirmation, and I can give you gifts, and I can give you an act of service, and I can give you physical touch, and I can give you quality time. But if you don't know that you don't need it from me in order for you to feel your worth and your sense of belonging, we've got a problem. I'm just, I'm just rearranging the furniture. That's all I'm doing. It doesn't mean we don't do them. It means that you can do those five things for me, but I'm responsible for my sense of belonging in this life and in this world, and this is where God comes in. That the Creator who loves us says, I want to be that one. So how about instead, you give me words of affirmation, worship. You give me quality time, contemplation. You give me the giving of gifts. You give me the act of service, and you give me that physical touch, that physical body, that defenseless body before God that says, I am present and I am here, and I stare into the face of God in my awkwardness instead of treating him like the guy with, on the corner with a sign and I spend time staring into the face of God so that he can tell me who I am. And he returns to us instead of the five languages. He gives to us our sense of identity and belonging. And when we get that in that fullness, now I'm not giving love out of my deficit and trying to garnish it up. Because you know, you can give a gift and not feel it, right? You can, you can give physical touch to somebody. To a person who has never had affection shown to them in their family, they never had a dad who was affectionate, they never had any of that stuff, everything is so new to them, it's awkward. It's awkward. What do I give to somebody who I, I love dearly? What if I, if I don't know how to do it and I can't do it, and when I do do it, I feel like I've just drained myself of everything? 
how do I do it? Well, maybe I shouldn't do it. Maybe I should just admit that I can't do it very well. And I give them the gift of authenticity. I give them the gift of honesty that goes, do you know how hard this is for me? I'm serious. It's so hard for me that I'm embarrassed to tell you that it's hard for me. It seems like it should be natural. Do you know that it's hard for me to give you a gift because I'm afraid that you're going to reject it? I'm going to say, you're going to say it's stupid. Or you're going, to, you're going to criticize it. Did anybody have that kind of criticism growing up? You don't have to put your hands up. But we're afraid to give gifts because they were going to get criticized. And then they didn't get the gift and, they, and they're called thoughtless. But it was mostly out of fear. <coughs> what we don't understand is that as we walk through the grocery store, we walk through the, uh, uh, come to the light, and we see people sitting in their cars. They're just objects to us, as Peter Rollins says. But what we don't understand is every one of them is having their own wrestling, serious maneuvering with the idea of love in some way or another. And in my fear, I'm afraid to notice it. Because I think I'm the only one dealing with those things. And mine's way bigger than everyone else's. And when we connect on that kind of out of control nature of God, then I can all of a sudden let go of the things I've been controlling that I actually have control, that I've been going out of control with that I actually have control over. Okay, let me repeat that again. Janine Roth. <coughs> When I refuse to go into the out-of-control nature of love and intimacy and its journey, then I will go out of control with the things that I actually have control over. Hmm. Okay? Love you can't control. You can't make somebody love you. You can't force it. You can't... Try to get God to affirm you, to tell you that you're okay, because you already are, and so what are you, what are you, what are you trying to get? You're getting something that is. You're, you're just wanting the feeling that it is, is what you're wanting. And feelings aren't a thing. They're a response to what the things are. It's not a thing. And so... As we move into the creator aspect of it, we see that scripture says the word became flesh and the word dwelt among us. And, we, and, and, and if it's not becoming flesh in the way that we reach out and the way that we touch and the way that we look and the way that we share in the forgiveness that we give, if we look beyond color, if we look beyond uh, 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 sexual identity, if we look beyond all of those aspects of it, we're beginning to love for the first time. When we focus on those things, we are participating in microaggressions. When we back off of those things and see people as having the breath of God, we are giving micro-affirmations. We're paying attention. We're looking. We're showing the brotherly kindness. I don't need to know you to show you brotherly <coughs> kindness. When we go into the realm of invention instead of creation, that's what happens. We're not, bringing, we're not creating something that isn't when we, when we get near to God. We're bringing to life what He has already declared from the day we were born and beyond that, that He said, you are my daughter in whom I am well pleased. You are my son in whom I am well pleased. I'm baffled by that because my thoughts have been so different. I, I'm trying really hard to pedal and catch up to it. And God tells me to be still and know that I am God. It already is. Become aware of what already has happened. And then listen to the words that Jesus said. He said, greater love has no person but that he would lay his life down for a friend. <coughs> so what he did was he reached out to you in a macro affection, in a macro affirmation. He reached out to you and me in one of the most glorious narratives that we could ever imagine, dying to self, in order that you would live, and then he's on the other side of the bank, making breakfast, saying, come on, let's eat. And he returns to Peter, and he says, hey Peter, while we're eating, can I ask you something? He says, yeah. He says, sure Jesus. 
He says, do you love me? Peter's like, do I love you? Come on, Jesus. He forgot he was the one that denied him three times. He says, do you love me? When Jesus said, do you love me? He was saying, do you, I don't know if you guys remember this word that I speak of. Uh, it's the form of agape. It's on your sheet. And it's why I put that on there all the time. Agapaho. Jesus was saying, hey, Peter, do you agapaho me? In other words, do you welcome me? While he's serving them food. Because see, agapaho is like welcoming somebody to a banquet, a celebration, to eat with them, to hang out with them. Okay? So do you, do you love me? And Peter returns the answer. His answer is, yeah, I love you. And he uses the Greek form phileo, phileo, which is, I have affection for you. Jesus was saying, do you welcome me in with you? And Peter said, yeah, I have affection for you. <laughs> he still doesn't quite understand it. And Jesus said, then you know what? Feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. Interesting, isn't it? What he's saying is, when you hang out with me and you learn to love, you're going to show macro affirmations to other people. Do it. Do it. And then he asks him again, hey, Peter, do you love me? And he's like, yeah, Jesus, I, I, I love you. Filial love. I feel that affection. Okay. When you, then it, if you do, then tend to my sheep. Hang out with them. Give them a place. Let them know they belong. Jesus does this three times. What do you think he might be doing here? He might be telling Peter, I know you denied me. That is of no consequence to me anymore because I'm going to teach you how to love. And love without action will never sink from the head to the heart. It'll be like this. It'll be duty. It'll be Christian behavior. It'll be guilt and shame. It'll be perfectionism. It'll be chores. I guess I ought to put the shopping cart back. <laughs> A micro affirmation is taking the shopping cart when no one is looking and putting it in the rack. I only say that because I struggle with it every time. <laughs> it's so far! <laughs> right? But there's, but then all I have to do is think about my nephew who works at Fry's. Doesn't have the best hips in the world. You know him, Elliot. And he comes home with a cheerful smile and a hi uncle. And I know he's been pulling carts all day long outside. It's like, you know what? There's another one that has to put that cart, go collect the carts. Makes me aware. <laughs> And there's so many things like that. That we start to live out the micro affirmations instead of the microaggressions. We go to love. Love being the gold of this spiritual life that we blend action. And you guys, you're going to do it awkwardly. It's not going to come out right. You're going to stumble through it. If you wait until you get it down really good, it's just no fun anymore. Be awkward about it. You know, and, and, and try it out. And, and if you're like me, you'll, you'll think about what you should have done different the whole next day and ask, wonder if you, know, you made a fool out of yourself and everybody noticed it. Because you reached out and you actually loved on purpose. This is the example of one of the most awkward loves ever done. Jesus is sitting around having a meal with them. And he's telling them how much pain he's going to go through and how it's going to be difficult. And then right after that, they fell asleep. You know what? He wasn't ashamed or afraid. He knew that down the road, they'd remember that experience. He knew down the road when they were having breakfast on the side of the lake, they're going to remember that. They're, he knows that it's going to go from a concept to an experience when they fail and they deny and they betray, when they stumble through it. And he says, so listen, because the soul is so fickle and because this becomes difficult, from now on, let's treat it like a meal. You have to eat. Anybody ever said that? Hey, you want to get lunch? Well, I got to eat. That's kind of what Jesus was saying. Hang out with God because you got to eat. 
So why don't you do it this way? Every time you eat this bread, remember that I created a micro affirmation in your life saying you belong. Let's stop making it about behavior. And let's taste and see that the Lord is good, that He is in and about and alongside and a companion, and that I am qualified. I am not certified, licensed, confirmed, ordained. I belonged before any of that. And we take it and we dip it as a symbol, not only of good brotherly kindness. I'm going to close with this. It's not just good brotherly kindness, which is this way. This meaning I am interdependent with others. I'm not dependent and I'm not codependent. I am interdependent with others. We need each other. And this, being reminded that I am utterly dependent on God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. Agapaho, welcome God into every aspect of your life. Love the Lord your God with everything you got. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said if we do that, we got it all covered. Did anything would fall into place with those two? Okay. So whatever other ten were in the Old Testament, they'll probably fall right in line with love the Lord. Or as they say, love God, love others. Love God, love others. I devote, I contemplate, I fix my eyes on Him. I gaze into his beauty. I spend solitude time. I recognize my awkwardness. I stumble through this life. And then I try it out this way. Because when I do that, it takes a foot. And God is being acknowledged in me and me to them. And I'm being God for them. Because I am joining in the natural creation of God's nature to love. Instead of the invention of love. We don't want to live the invention anymore. Let's make it real. Please come and, and um, have communion. I'll put some music on. Let's keep a level of, of uh, whisper uh, so that everybody can, can take. And just remember that as you eat this bread, as you dip it in this cup, that you are one with God. Atonement at one mint. We celebrate that. God, thank you for your love and your compassion. Thank you for your mercy, your grace. We confess we don't know you but we will join on a journey of knowing you. Amen. Amen.